here tonight, one of the things, how do we glorify God together? We glorify God together through our testimonies. Remember last Tuesday, I was, I was, I was um, talking about how can we glorify God? And one of the ways we glorify God is through our testimonies. And I think one of the things that a lot of us you know, are afraid to share that, where the Lord brought us. You know, one of the things that um, I think blesses us and blesses me when I hear a testimony of somebody. You know, how where the Lord brought him out from. So again, a man tonight, I'm going to be uh, bringing out my brother Havis. He's, he's going to be sitting here. We're going to talk a little bit about his testimony. Um, so again, I've called my brother Havis to come up. And again, for those who know my brother Havis. He is my baby brother. He inherited the hair. Yes, he did. So for those who know, he's actually my baby brother. Yes, so uh, we are a brother of four now. Um, you know, we, five. Yes, no. Well, we were brother of five. One of them, we used to be brother of six, but now we're brother of five. Uh, one was called to be with the Lord. Uh, but yeah, this is my brother Havis. You know, he is the baby one again. I was jealous because I remember that he grew beer and I couldn't grow beer. And I was upset that he inherited that. But again, uh, Havis, thank you again for um, coming tonight and, uh, um, and wanted to share your testimony. Uh, for you guys know him, Havis, you know, he is part of the Men's Life Leadership here. He has a group with, um, who are you teaming up with? David Figueroa. David Figueroa. And again, but uh, I know that sometimes we, you see us in this position, and again, and every time I get to my group, I always let the men know, listen, just because I'm sitting in this seat, uh, remember, I, I put my pants like you do, one leg at a time. So again, we all, man, we all have our struggles, but, but the grace of God, you know, we persevere. And again, my brother Javis here, you know, um, he has a great testimony. And I wanted to share it because, you know what, I know that... Um, it's funny how when he was sharing his testimony at marriage, at married life, uh, I started like, "Whoa, you know what? Why can't he share his testimony at men's life?" And it's actually going to connect to where I actually, at the end, will finish. Hopefully, we could get a video uh, 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 for our, our coming. Oh, love it! Praise God! So we're going to have a video. Oh no! Keep going. All right. Again, <laughs> Habis, uh, again, uh, he's actually not only part of men's life. He joined the team, I think, last month, right? Well, two months ago. About two months ago. Uh, for Mary Life. And again, uh, but again, just with the Lord. Man, praise God. Yeah. Again, and, and it, it is all because, again, with the Lord doing in his life. But it never ever started like that. And this is why I want to share a little bit of his testimony. We know Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. And we know a wage is something we work towards, something we actively pursue whether we realize it. And we know that that death here refers not to a physical death, but a spiritual death, which could lead to eternal damnation, which in turn upon in hell. And I wanted to share a little bit because I know he had never shared the testimony of a day where he almost encountered death. And again, uh, Javis, you know, take us back to that place. I know you mentioned to a lot of men, uh, just take us back. And again, give us a little bit of that moment where, where you um, got into the car accident. Let's go back to that place. Uh, good, uh, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Uh, once again, my name is Javis Agado. I'm his little brother. Um, yeah, so, I mean, for uh, many, many of you guys know, we came from a Christian family. Uh, we grew in the Word. Uh, but high school, I ended up hanging out with the wrong crowd. Um, actually, matter of fact, uh, one of the guys that we hang out with back in the day, he came here, Ludwig. Um, but wow. So you get to see the difference, right? Praise um, God. So yeah, I uh, so hang out with the wrong crowd. Um, started partying, doing drugs. Well, not drugs at the time, just drinking. Um, but in 06, I was 19. Um, I got a call from my friend. Um, he goes, hey, dude, I was in, actually here in, in Londale. He's like, hey, dude, we're having a big party. Come on down. You're the life of the party. And I was like, dude, it was like 10.30 p.m. I was like, dude, I'm, I'm already at home. He goes, yeah, dude, just come through. Have somebody pick you up. So one of my sisters will always pick me up. So I gave her a call. I was like, hey, sis, can you pick me up? She lived in Riverside. This was in Riverside. I was like, can you pick me up? Uh, my friends want to hang out, and I need a ride over there. So she goes, yeah, I'll go pick you up. So I'm like, perfect. Boom. Um, 
In the meantime, she was going to come pick me up, did a couple phone calls, got a couple drugs, kept drinking, invited three of my friends. I was like, hey, dude, I'm going to go to a party in Riverside. You guys want to join? I'll bring you guys back uh, on Sunday. This was on, I believe, I want to say Friday night. So, yeah, my sister gets there, picks us up in her little Toyota Corolla, like a 90-something. We're driving to Riverside, um, and we're literally four or three exits away from my house. Uh, we get hit. We get hit uh, like a, a pig maneuver type of thing. So I remember we, we started spinning, um, and then the back tires finally hit the road. And when we hit the road, uh, we kind of did a stop, and then we started flipping. On the first flip, um, I remember hitting my head on the window on the side. I was in the back passenger side. I hit my head and kind of blacked out, not knowing that I'll, I flew out of the car, out of the back windshield. Um, I woke up midair. It's kind of funny when I think about it, you know, like Superman a little bit. I'm flying in the air, and I tumble. Uh, keep in mind, this car started flipping, and so it slingshotted me ahead of it. Uh, it threw me. I tumbled on the floor, and it finally came to a stop. Um, as I came to a stop, I'm trying to figure out what's going on with me, where am I at? But then I realized the car is still flipping towards me. And um, I was drunk, I was high, I had drugs in me. The first thing I noticed, the car was in the land on me. I knew the word, I knew God. And I remember I prayed, I said, Lord, if I die right now, I know where I'm going. Just give me one more chance. I promise I'll follow you for the rest of my life. I promise I'll come back to church. And as a car, I remember, it's crazy because everything slowed down. Like, everything was like slow motion. I remember the car coming towards me, and either there was going to flip on me, I mean, uh, uh, continue to flip once it hit me, or just land where I was at. But it was landing, and I remember I did that prayer, and I said, Lord, just give me one more chance. And I remember a strong wind came. Keep in mind, my sister and my friends are still in the car. A strong wind came and made the car flip me, flip over me. It didn't even, didn't even touch the floor. It kind of just flipped one more time and it continued to flip. And I remember I just blacked out. Um, I guess I called, uh, I called the, the paramedics. I called my parents uh, with both dislocated kneecaps, uh, dislocated shoulders. I don't remember doing any of that. But then my sister even told me that I even pulled them out of the car. Um, like I said, I don't remember most of that. Um, I have contacts. I've always been wearing contacts. So somehow some oil, agent oil, landed in my face all over my eyes. So not, not only did I just dislocate my shoulders and my, my, my knees, but I also had engine oil in my eyes. Uh, so when I got to the hospital, I remember uh, looking down, and my legs were this, like triple the size of what I am now. Uh, my shorts, everything was ripped up. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it was like the worst experience ever, but I remember saying, Lord, like, you know, that was my prayer. Lord, give me one more chance, and I'll come back to you. Now, let's go ahead. Now, again, how many of us been in that situation, right, where we, we, we definitely see death, and we say to God, Lord, give me one more chance? You know what? Um, because we're going to continue. Again, he didn't, he didn't follow that. You know, we see, we see Proverbs 60, 25 tells us there's a way that appears to be right, but at the end leads to death. See, the enemy, one of the things you got to remember, sin is rebellion against God. Sin separates us from the, from the creator and sustainer of life. And again, my brother here, you know what, when he was sharing me that story, you know, I was like, whoa, you know what, I can't believe it. I could have lost you at a young age. You've got to remember, Jesus said in John 4, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And one of the things that my brother, you know, when he was sharing that, you know what, I was like, man, I wish you would have gave you, you would have definitely committed that. But what happened? He would continue that life. And I remember that uh, going forward, you know what, I know that he said he was continuing to do drugs, continuing to do alcohol. And, and finally, at what, what age you said that you, you got married? Um, so, yeah, uh, as, that's kind of funny because, yeah, so I couldn't walk. I remember I, had, I, had, I was in a wheelchair and, and crunches for, like, 
about six months or so. So I had no option than to go to church, right? Because I couldn't drive myself nowhere. I couldn't go nowhere. So I started attending church. And since I started attending church, that's where I met my wife. Uh, we were, you know, we were just friends at the time, but um, she, we knew each other before then, but I was in the world, so I didn't really, you know, give her too much attention. But the fact that I couldn't walk and I was in a wheelchair, she started pushing me around in church <laughs> and stuff like that. So, you know, that kind of like attracted me towards her now, you know, because I had all these girls, but yet when, since I was hopeless, I wasn't able to do anything, no one was reaching out to me. But she, you know, came out and she started doing all that stuff, and I'm, man, you know, maybe this is the girl that I need in my life, because the ones that I have are no longer here because how I look, right? Uh, but yeah, so that happened. We started talking 2007, so ended up getting married in 2010. And it's funny how she's sharing that, right? Even in his, <laughs> praise God, amen. And listen, I love this story because we see God's grace. We see God's love towards him. Because yet he, he, even though he, you know, he definitely said, you know, he, he, God brought him <laughs> his wife. You know what? And it's beautiful the way God is, you know what? But let's continue. I know that, again, I uh, went forward, you know, it looks like that was your wife. Uh, again, uh, uh, you got married, right? Yeah, yeah. Got married. So uh, we got married, and then uh, a year later, we ended up having my, my son, which brought us back to church because she used to go to church. So, so we started attending church again. Um, I kind of left that, you know, worldly life for a while. Because, uh, I mean, you know what, I have a kid now. I'm trying to get better. I want to be a better dad for him, you know, be a great example. But a year later, a year and a half later, friends came back in the picture. So drinking came back and partying came back and all that. And I walked away once again. But my wife kept going to church. So next question, we continue to see Roman. Paul, Paul talks in the book of Romans, chapter 6. The sin enslaves us. And let's go back to how you were enslaved to that sin. And that sin not only enslaved you, but also enslaved your family, your, your wife. Let's go back to it. We know that here verses, don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as to being enslaved, you are a slave, the one you obey, whether you are a slave to sin which leads to death. So let's go back to how, again, you know, you continue that life. Uh, again, it, it, let's just talk about how it affected your relationship with your wife. Um, yeah, so a year in, year and a half in marriage, you know, all the lovey-dovey thing came out the window after six months. Arguments started happening, and that's when the enemy started putting it in my head. I was 21 when we got married. She was 21, the same age. The enemy started putting it in my head, look, you just wasted your your, your youth, you know, uh, you you kind of got yourself in shackles, shackles with her, you know, go out and party, enjoy yourself. And I, and I started believing that. So I started partying, I started doing this and that, and to the point where um, the enemy started putting it in my mind, divorce her. You know, the best way for you to have fun is getting rid of her. And I was believing it, you know, I was believing it. So I remember like before we actually talked about it, I would just start arguments, arguments that hoping that it would lead to her bringing that subject up. Um, but it never did, so I brought it up. And it got to the point where I started mistreating her. I started mistreating her, and yeah, about a year and a half in, she's like, you know what, I'm done. I, I, I'm, I'm leaving you, I can't handle you. Um, and instead of me saying no, I'm like, go, good. You know, for me it was okay, that's what I wanted, I got it. You know, um, but you know, my brother Albert and his wife have been part in our marriage, you know, been a blessing. She And I'm thankful for that, because she reached out to my sister-in-law, his wife, and she kind of knocked some sense onto her. And she came back and said, I'm not leaving you. And I'm like, man, you know, I thought I was off. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it went like that for, you know, the first, the next two years, we kind of just worked it out, but still arguments there. So then it's when the enemy is like, well, how come, and you know, the reason we're arguing is because she was still going to church. I was still partying. So then the enemy started putting it in my mind and saying, hey, how come you, you don't invite her? to join you in your activities. And I'm like, you know what, you're right. So she didn't right away, but eventually she did. Eventually, she, and, and she's like, you know what, yeah, I'll start joining you. Like that, I can keep an eye on you, right? So yeah, she started joining me, uh, we'd go party together, started drinking together, um, and went out that for years. But the, the enemy had 
painted a picture telling me that my marriage was great again because the arguments weren't there no more, right? Now we were both doing, doing it together, so there was no reason for us to argue. So that's why it became so easy for me to continue that life because now I had my wife with me, participating with me. And there was no me coming home drunk. Now we both come home drunk, right? There was no arguments no more. So it, it kept going like that for a while. You know what? And sometimes we think that that life is going to bring happiness, joy, but it's not. See, Jesus tells us here in John 8, 34, says, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. But I love the message version because you know what? He reached a point where he saw that it, there was no life there. Look at the message version. It says here, I tell you mostly something, that anyone who chooses a life of sin is trapped in a dead end life. And it is, in fact, a slave. Take us to the moment where you thought that everything was good, but it got to a point that you feel like, you know, you were getting nowhere to the point of even trying to take your life away. Yeah, so fast forward, uh, 2017, um, we had a, a, one of the biggest, well, one of the first uh, big tragedies in our, in our family where we lost a, a sibling and... Um, so that's actually stopped my wife from drinking because she got scared. She started questioning her, her salvation. Um, me, on the other hand, it hit me. I started drinking more. Uh, and that's when I turned into, into drugs, you know. Um, so I remember she's like, you know what, I'm done doing this. I'm going to go back to church. This is not taking me anywhere. So I'm like, go ahead, do what you got to do, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And 17, we, that happened. But I remember 17, that's when I hit my lowest. Uh, I remember I used to always make like, fun of, when I was at the bars, I would make fun of people that were drinking by themselves. I'm like, man, that's an alcoholic right there. You know, I, I never want to be like that. But yet, at the end of 2017, I'm the one at the bar by myself, drinking for no reason, right? Instead of spending time with my, my, my wife or my kids, I found myself there. And it got to the point where, that the, the, the beer, the alcohol, the, the cocaine wasn't doing nothing for me no more. Um, it was getting to a point where I felt hopeless. I felt like, uh, like I wasn't worth nothing no more. Um, and the enemy, I gave the enemy the opportunity to put stuff in my head telling me, if you end your life, all these problems will go away. And keep in mind, I didn't have any problems, but the enemy was putting those in my mind, saying that I did have problems. I had my wife. I had my beautiful kids. I had a home, a roof over my head. I had everything. Like, but yet, the enemy was telling me I had nothing. So I remember I would just drink and do like 20 lines of Coke a day, you know, and nothing. And at times, I would drunk, dry, dry drunk, and I'm on the freeway, and he would tell me, just throw yourself off the freeway. Drive off. <laughs> And I remember I would think about it and how he even like swerve, hoping a car would hit me. And nothing, I mean, there was a couple of times where they actually missed me by like a little. And I'm like, all right, I guess it's not my time to go. And I'll just ride home. Next week, I'll go through the same thing, go back to drugs again, and just, just feel that emptiness. You know, we know that, excuse me, John 10, Jesus tells us that the enemy, that's what he does. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's one thing when we allow the enemy to, to come and to whisper into us. And we know that the Bible speaks so much about condemnation because of the sin which penetrates in mankind. But the thing is, that, listen, one of the things that I was sharing last Tuesday, you know what? We are enslaved to sin. Instead of us repenting at the moment, we, we kind of stay. Remember the story of Johnny and, uh, uh, I forgot her name, where, you know, he killed the duck and, and, and she was, he was being enslaved by his sister? That's what it is. The enemy, that's what it does. You know, but we know that here the Bible tells us that as the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, the Bible says that I have come, that you may have life and have it in abundance. And as my brother was sharing to me that he was going through those moments I was reminded here how even the prophet Isaiah uh, uh, tells us because sometimes we feel that we're, God doesn't want to listen to us no more. God is done with us because we are so deep into our sin. 
But we forget the story in the Bible that God has given us. One of the uh, stories that it always stick to me when I was young was the prodigal son, right? How it describes how God is when he's just waiting for us. But sometimes we believe the lie of the enemy. I tell people, you know what, um, the enemy has no power. He's a created being. You cannot put him next to God. Nah, get him in close. He's a created being. The only power that he has is he's a liar. And when we believe in his lies, we empower his lies. And that's what was happening to my brother that moment. He was feeling like he was worth it. And the enemy was just trying to take him away. But see, here, <clears throat> we, uh, we're reminded through the prophet Isaiah. He says, but our iniquities, our sin, have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so he does not hear. We hear in the beginning, we see the sin was the one that separated mankind, right? We see that Adam, you know, when he committed sin, what did he do? He was hiding. And that's what it does, sin does. It doesn't allow us to be able to come and, and I, you know, God is there waiting for us. God knew he was there. He just like, he knew that there was no, there was a separation. But as I was sharing last week, we see the grace of God since the beginning. I was sharing that the, 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 we saw it through last week when I said that the man and his wife walking in the garden. It says here, Genesis 3, 9 says, Then the man and his wife heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden, the breeze of the day, and they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord, he says, but the Lord God called out to man. Where are you? And God is still calling us. But sometimes what happened, our sin is not allowing us. And going back to my brother, you know what? The enemy was really getting to him. I didn't even know he was going through, but yet I was praying. I remember that when I was serving, uh, I remember that I, I was like, I, I know that my brothers were not doing good in the Lord, and, and, and I was worried about them. And I remember I said, I, I one, one Sunday night, I said, Lord, I, I'm going to stop serving, and I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and focus on my family. And I remember that I was, as I was walking out with that mentality, a, a, a brother, a sister, can you remember, came up to me and goes, hey, brother, I'm just to let you know, uh, thank you for, for serving. And again, uh, uh, you've been a blessing. And, and I'm like, and that was the Lord telling me, you continue to serve. And the Lord told me, I hear voices, you don't worry about your brothers. You continue to pray for them and continue doing my will. And I remember that I continued to serve. I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and serve you. But here we see in the beginning, you know, that, that, that how the Lord showed us his grace. How the grace began in the Garden of Eden when God killed an animal to cover the sins of Adam and Eve. I told you guys, God had, could have killed the first human right there for their disobedience. And same happens. He could have died right there when the car could have just, he would have been done for his disobedience. But we continue constantly to see God's grace in our life. And then let's, let's go a little before because I remember when he, my brother Harvey was going to the moment, you know, he, everything was just going bad. I remember 2018. Let's go back to 2018. And this is where I want to focus, man. 2018. I remember that we had our announcement for our men's retreat. And I remember that I invited all my brothers, never thinking that my brother Harvest would be the one going. So I remember, I, I, I go, hey, brother, uh, we're having a mentor tree coming up. You should come out. So take us back to that when I, when I told you about the mentor tree. Yeah, so uh, that was, uh, I believe, a month or so before April. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was, you know, those dark, dark times still. Um, at that time, I was already trying crystal. Um, so I was, finding, you know, I, was, I was finding a way out. But at the same time, before he actually uh, came, came and told me about the retreat, um, I remember um, I started asking myself, like, because in the beginning when I was in sin, I would think about it before I did it. Or when I did it, I'll feel guilty. But towards 18, I mean, being in towards 18, I remember I was doing it without feeling guilt now. I, it was just becoming easy for me to fall into that sin. But then I remember I started questioning myself, like, am I losing the fear of the Lord? Is the Lord still with me? Or did he just forget, did he forget about me? And I remember at that time, I, I, I was just 
just doing all this stuff, all these drugs. And, and that's when my brother came. And he told me, hey, bro, you know what? Um, there's a retreat coming up. Uh, I want you to, you know, join us. And he, he just didn't tell me once. He told me a few times. And to the point where the enemy told me, just tell him yes, yeah, so he can shut up. <laughs> so that's what I did. I said, yeah, I'll go, right? Because that's the only way he's going to stop asking me. So I remember I said, yeah, I'll go, you know. And this was maybe a month before or so. Still, you know, feeling that way. And, and the thing about it, how he said he didn't even know I was going through it, you know, that's why I want to tell you, man, you know, we, we men, we know how to hide stuff, right? We, we're, sometimes our pride kicks in. We don't want to open up just one another. And that was me. You know, I, even though I was, I was going through all that, I could have reached out, right? I could have asked for prayer. I knew the word. I could have gone to somebody that knew the word and said, hey, you know what? I'm going through this. Can you pray for me? But I didn't. I hid it very well. I, I, from 2014 to like 17, 18, it's a blank to me because drugs, that's all I was doing. That's all I remember I was doing. But I hid it pretty well for my family. Maybe not moms and pops because moms and pops kind of knows everything, you know. But for my brothers, I remember family activities. I was zoned out because I was probably recovering, you know, from all the drugs. Um, but, yeah, see, he asked me, and I'm like, all right, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. And, uh, yeah, we left it at that. We left it at that. And um, I remember... Two weeks before, he had asked me one more time, and I said, yeah, once again, so he stopped bugging me. But then as it got closer, I want to say a week or so before, I told, I remember I, I said, God, I want to go. I want to go because I want to change. I don't want to be the same man. I don't want to be the same husband. I don't want to be the same parent to my kids. So I ended up paying for the ticket. Not, not telling nobody. I just paid for it because I told myself, if I pay for this, I'm going to have to go because 145 bucks out the window if I miss out, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I paid for it. I paid for it, and I'm like, okay, cool, good to go. He once again reached out to me, and I told him, hey, bro, I already paid for it. He goes, what? You did? I was like, yeah, I paid for it. So boom. Days before, the enemy, man, you know, that's well, actually, before I paid for it, right before I put my information on the thing, the enemy is like, that's 145 bucks. You know what you can do with that? You know how much drugs you can get with that? And I'm like, you're right, you know? So, yeah, maybe not. And I remember it took me a while to, for me to, uh, you know, press and submit, you know, to pay. But because all those thoughts were coming to me. But then, then again, the Holy Spirit kicked in and said, you know how much money you're spending on spending those drugs? 145 bucks is nothing. Just pay for it. You're not going to regret it. And that's when I paid for it. But I remember the day before, two days before, um, the... Uh, um, <clears throat> Yeah, praise God. Amen. I remember the day before, I started feeling this tug, like saying, you know what? There's probably someone out there in church that's worse than me. They probably need it more than me. Well, I'm just going to donate my ticket to somebody that actually needs it. And that's what the enemy was telling me. And it was going to get to a point where I was going to text my brother and say, hey, bro, look for somebody that's not, in my mind, look for somebody that's worse than me. <laughs> you know? They might need it. You know? And I remember I was contemplating how to text that to my brothers. Hey, look for somebody, you know, because I don't need it. I'm not as bad, you know. I know the word. I go to church for holidays, you know, Easter, you know, uh, Christmas, all those. So in my mind, I'm doing fine even though I'm in my sin, you know. But, yeah, it, it came to that point. You know, what? going back to I love it, you know, he finally got to the point of surrender. You know, being putting that payment there, you know, it was a sign that, you know, God, God wanted to change him. You know what, and sometimes, you know what, I think the thing is that we get so distracted here, you know, with things working, and, and that's what, listen, you know, man, just, brother, come out. You know, we're going to be away from everything, and it's just going to be you and God. And I love, we see in the Bible, Jesus did that. He went away. And that's why, to me, I, I'm so, I, I love retreats. You know, I, I pray that when I get old, I'm still going, even though the beds are not comfortable, but because I'm not going there to sleep good, I'm going there to spend time with the Lord. And again, let's go back to the moment, you know, you went, you finally surrender, surrender. So uh, take us back to the first night, second night, and then the third night. So, yeah, so I remember uh, the day, the morning, um, I was still, you know, yes, no. But I remember I prayed, and I said, Lord, I woke up early. I remember that day. I woke up early, and I said, Lord, uh, I'm going to go, but if I go, I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to go feel the Holy Spirit while I'm there. And then come back, and I'm back to my old ways. And I remember I prayed and I cried, Lord, I really want to change. 
I want to go and come back a different man. You know, I, it's, it's a waste of time if I just go. But <laughs> the enemy was like, this, it's just a gateway for you. You know, you're just going to go up to the mountains and stuff like that. But I'm like, no, you know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And with that prayer, I'm going to change. I'm going to change. Remember the first night we got there? You know, I already knew a couple of the brothers, I think. Uh, not many, but a few. But over there, we got to know more people. And, you know, the first night went well. You know, like I said, I grew up in a Christian family, so I, I knew some, you know, the Bible. I knew the worship songs. So, you know, I, I had that little feeling, you know. But it wasn't, it wasn't um, what I was seeking, right? It was just, that was just a little warm feeling. The second day, I remember I prayed. I said, Lord, I still feel the same. You know, I still feel like if I go down today, I'm going to go back to my old ways. Like, I don't want to feel that way. So I remember Sunday night came. Um, I, I believe that was Bu uh, Buddy Luna's testimony night. Yeah, for those that know him, uh, he passed away. He's already with, he made it to heaven now. But I remember he gave his testimony. And that's when God started doing the change in me. Because the enemy was telling me I didn't have nothing. Right? And, and, he was, and I was complaining about the little things. But when Buddy Luna gave his testimony of what he, he's go what he went through, and, and everything that he went through, I'm like, wow. You know, for him to have that smile in his face, to, for him to have that joy that he has, and for him to praise God for what he's went through, what he's going through, why am I complaining? Right? For those that know his story, you know what he's been through, right? He went through. And that's when the God started doing that little change in my life that night. I remember I'm like, Lord, forgive me for complaining for the little things. Right? I mean, look at this guy here. He's giving you all the praise. Right, so Sunday night came, I prayed, I raised my hands for the first time, that pride get out, get, went out the way, but I still didn't feel that, that joy that I, that I knew I, I, I could have had, right? So I remember that, that sun, Saturday night, we went to bed, and I remember I just stayed up and I prayed, Lord, like, it, it's just been a waste of time for me. It's two days, I heard your word, I heard your message, I heard your songs, but I still feel the same way. Please don't let this be a waste, you know? And I remember I prayed and I prayed, and not till Sunday, the message was given. And then I started looking around and I started looking at all the men, you know, and I started seeing men that I would have never thought would raise their hand, would cry. And when I seen them, I'm like, that's what I want. I want to feel that way. I want to surrender my all. And I said, Lord, remove my pride, remove everything that's stopping me from raising my hand fully. And just let me give you all. And that once I gave that prayer, I just dropped to my knees. And I felt like a whole weight was just taken off me. Yeah. I, I remember I felt this peace. And I just felt, some, I was like, I can't, so, I mean, when you guys receive it, fellas, you guys will know. And if you guys receive it, you know. Yeah. It just, it was just wonderful. And I felt that when I was young, so I knew, God, you're with me. You never left me. I left you. And it's so beautiful. Again, that surrender, right? Yeah. And that's what God just wants from us, man, to surrender to him. And then the transformation begins. You know, I love Joe, Joe 2.13, the New Living Translation. It says, don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your heart instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate. Slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. Man, we serve an awesome God. You know what, again, yeah, to hear, you know, what he went through and to see what it costs for us to just give our hearts to God. I remember last Tuesday when Pastor Chris were here, you know, how he told that man, have you surrendered to God? How do you do it? And it gets so simple. Just acknowledge, you listen, I need you, Jesus. I need you. And accept him into your heart. You know, that's what I believe. I believe that's why, you know, my brother here, you know, I really believe that the, the gospel, the good news, it is the power to salvation to all who believe. Because you know what? I love it when he came back from the man's retreat, even his wife saw the transformation. And again, man, and I'm not here trying to really say, oh, go to marriage. But listen, let me tell you something. Something we just need to get away and be alone with the Lord. And again, from there we see his transformation. You know, I think you came in on, on uh, men's life, what, 20? I came, yeah, so, 
yeah, back to my wife, right? <laughs> so, like I say, she knew my, my life before I went to the retreat. Um, when I came back, you know, I, I, I had that peace with me. I, I was a whole different man. A lot of people, you know how to tell when you just cut off all your drugs, cold turkey? But that was me. Alcohol was gone. Drugs were gone. My Praise wife didn't God. believe it. She goes, nah, you're lying to me now. You know? And I was like, no, babe. Like, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't crave that no more. So she didn't believe me the first, you know, but she was just looking at me, kind of see if I was lying to her or not, or, you know, kind of just telling her what she wanted to hear, you know. So um, that was 2018. I started coming here. Uh, but funny story before that, I was brought here in 2003 with my ex girlfriend. She used to attend this church. Um, so my wife knew that. So when I started coming here in 2018, my wife didn't want to come because she knew my ex girlfriend used to come here. And I remember I prayed, and I'm like, Lord, you know, I really love this church. Because when I came to 2003, the first pastor I met here was Pastor Dennis. He was a high school pastor then. And I remember he, he, he received me with open arms, and, and I loved it, right? So when I came back, that's the first person I went to look for. But I don't think he was part of the youth anymore. But I'm like, you know what? I love it. I came, and I'm like, Lord, this is my church. You know, I'm a, I'm a 10 here. I mean, I'm here for a reason, right? I'm going to come here. But that was a battle now. I wanted my wife to attend here. But she didn't want to. She didn't want us to be part of this church because of my ex-girlfriend at that time. So I remember that was like a little battle in between. Uh, towards the end of 2018, that's when I joined the uh, usher ministry. But I didn't accept it right away because I knew my wife wasn't happy of me coming to this church knowing she was still here. So to, you know, make her happy, I said, okay, babe, we'll, then we'll go to another church. You know, we'll look for one where we're both going to serve and, and grow, you know, spiritually. And she goes, okay. And in my prayer, I was like, Lord, change my mom's, my wife's mind. You know, I really want to come to this church. But I'm like, but I don't want to, I don't want that to be something that's going to cause arguments. So I remember like a month went by and I was going to tell her, I was going to tell a uh, uh, brother Mark, uh, 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 Ariano, uh, no, you know, to the usher. But then my wife came up to me and she goes, babe, go ahead. Let's start ushering. I was like, uh, the Lord. He said, this is our church. And I was like, are you sure? Like, I even like, are you sure? You know, I don't want arguments later on. She goes, nah, this is our church. So, yeah, I joined the usher ministry towards the end of 18, beginning of 19. Uh, 2020, uh, Pastor uh, Rob spoke to me. I uh, became part of the men's ministry 2021. Praise God. And I love it because <clears throat> that surrender started the transformation. And I love it. He came in and he didn't sit down. He said, you know, I want to serve. And that's why I encourage a lot of men. You know, you've been here coming. You know what? Get busy. Start serving. You'll grow spiritually. And also we get to see your talents. You know, I love to see, you know, men coming, serving. You know, but I know sometimes we get so afraid. But you know what? That fear is it's not, it's from the enemy. You know, you got to activate your faith. Man, let me tell you something. My brother, when he made that, that decision, he surrendered. Transformation began. You know what Romans 2, uh, 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen, once you say yes to Jesus, listen, your focus is to do what Jesus came to do. He came to serve. Man, again, we could go on. But one of the things I wanted to let you listen, sometimes we do get to get away. And I know many, many of us here say, you know, retreats, ah, oh, they're just a waste of money. Let me tell you something. When you go for a purpose, and it's to see God. God would meet you. He could meet you anywhere, but you know, I love these retreats because retreats has been part of what the Lord's been using for us men to get out. And again, praise God's my brother. You know, they, you know, again, they, even though I was bugging him to go, you know what? That was, I was just planting seeds. You know, I didn't give up. And man, again, we could definitely go on testimony, but I praise God because even though I was still serving here, God's promises were truth when he says, you take care of my work, I'll take care of your family. And this is the fruit that we see here. Man, so again, <laughs> praise God. And we're going to pray. But before we pray, oh, God. I just want to encourage you guys, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I want to say if it wasn't for the retreat, I wouldn't be here right now. I'll probably either be dead or in jail, you know, divorce, whatever, you know. But I want to do encourage you guys, you know, a lot of you men, I know you guys come to church. And you guys are, you know, doing your devotions and stuff like that. But this is just not for 
men that are trying to, you know, walk, you know, with Christ. Now, it's also for men that are walking with Christ. This gives you an opportunity to grow. Because when we're out here, you know, in, 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 in the city, we have so many distractions. You know, and that's one thing my brother asked me. He goes, were you thinking about your wife or anything while you were up there? And as I thought about it, no, I wasn't. Right? My, um, my, my focus was me changing my life. Right? I didn't worry about my wife. I didn't worry about my kids. I didn't worry about my job or nothing. Right? And that's why the retreats are so beautiful because we, we get disconnected from the world. Right? And we get the alone time. And not just the alone time with God, but we get the alone time with men that are trying to do the same thing you're doing. So, brothers, I really encourage you guys, if, if you've been walking with the Lord for 10 years, glory to God. If you're walking with the, with the Lord for five months, two weeks, you guys need this, you know. And, and take that step of faith. You know, I, I really believe, yeah, I mean, when you start coming to church and, and, and attending these men's ministries, jo- join the ministries now. You know, keep yourself busy because the, the more time you give the enemy, uh, 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 I mean, yeah, the more time you give the enemy, that's, that's when the enemy starts putting these lies, you know, in your head. You, you don't need church. You could do this by yourself. And that's why a lot of men, and there's a lot of men that I've known in this church that are no longer here or are coming back. But the reason what that happened is because they isolated themselves. They said, I can do this by myself. But no, when you're by yourself, that gives the enemy the opportunity to attack you by yourself. That's what the word says. Man sharpened iron, right? Where two or more are gathered. There's a reason why the Bible says that, right? Because it's hard for the enemy to attack you when you have a brother with you. Man. you know, so, bro, man, come out, enjoy. And if you know somebody that needs this retreat, invite them. Shoot, if you don't have the money, pray, Lord, give me some money so I can pay for them. You know, it's, it's, you, it's be a blessing for you and for them. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Before we pray, I wanted to show you guys a video of our 2019 men's retreat. I want to show you, kind of pump you guys up. I know the registration, we're getting ready to open it up. Uh, I, want, I want this registration, once it's open, that to be men right lined up, ready to go. Let's go ahead and play that video. We are here to meet with Jesus. We put Christ first. And you're invited on the ultimate Christian men's retreat. It's you and Jesus on the mountain. This weekend, gentlemen, why not? Why not pray and ask God to give you a transformation? It's just amazing to be able to come and gather with the so many brothers. See, the problem sometimes is we know this stuff. In the book of Acts, Paul said, listen, you guys, you already know this stuff. That's the problem. Yeah, just, I'm just ready for uh, what Satan's going to try to throw at me. I'm going to make sure I have the armor of God. God wants transformation in your life. If you ever think you've arrived, then I promise you, you've already stopped. Getting rid of uh, all the anger. You know, a lot of anger inside, getting rid of that. Putting Jesus first, definitely gonna help. So, the biggest thing for me. God's for a charge on the ground where you say, oh, I'm here. I want to see change. I want my all back. I'm ready right now. Be able to fight on, fight back, be the strength I've given you. If you're going to get good at something, get good at growing in your walk with God. Everything I say, all my things, everything. That it'll all be about God no more. I let go of my addiction and I'm ready to go and serve the Lord the right way. But every time it's God wooing you, say, back, fight the right fight, fight the good fight. This is the battle, the inward life of a man. God 
looks for men who are submitted to and led by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's it. Guess what? Every single man in this room can fulfill that. Man, I'm pumped. Can't wait for that mango cheese. This year, we're going to have it at, at Mile High Pines. Uh, it's still Big Bird. It's going to be behind. It's kind of actually um, more kind of flat, but there's a lot of activities, too. We've got a hiking again. So, I, and man, I'm excited for this mango cheese. I pray you put it in your calendar, and you're just waiting for that to open up. Amen? So let's pray. Uh, God, we thank you again, Father, for even <laughs> watching that video, that transformation. The Father, you do in each of our lives when we surrender to you. And even to hear my brother's testimony, to see, Father, where you brought him out from. And how to put him in a place, Father, where he could bring honor and glory to your name through his past. And Father, I pray even tonight, Father, again, there's many men here, Father, maybe are, are again, like my brother says, is that pride? They don't allow us to open up and share I pray that tonight the man will open up and that surrender begin today and that we will see these men rising up, being those fellow soldiers for your kingdom, Father. And I pray even now, Father, move in each of our hearts. We thank you again, Father, once again for the testimony my brother shared today. All glory to your name. It is only by your grace that he's here. And we see the power that, Father, you do in our life when we surrender and we give it all to you. Thank you again for tonight, Father. And I pray even now, Father, as we get together to a group time, Father, you would just, again, bless our time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. amen.